I can talk loud. I don't need the mic that quite loud, quite that loud, but it's, it is a joy and a privilege for me to be here, get to see my parents this week. I came in on Thursday and get to go back this afternoon because unlike school here, my spring break was this last week. So I get to restart life as usual again tomorrow. Our scripture reading this morning is in part perhaps one of the most familiar texts in all of scripture. And as such, even though the words are probably on the screen, I invite you to to pay more attention to the words you hear rather than the words you see on the screen. The Gospels were originally written to be heard rather than read. And so I invite you at this time to try to experience that and listen intentionally for something that you may not have noticed before. I'll be reading the first 21 verses of the third chapter of John's Gospel. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for, for no one can do the, th- the signs that you do apart from God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born again after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I, that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear it, the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. But Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, and just as Moses lifted up the, servant, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Let us pray. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you and your children. Amen. I have to confess, I love John's Gospel. It's perhaps the most theologically sophisticated of the four Gospels, in part because it's the latest 
gospel in our Bibles to be written. It's the latest gospel to be written, and therefore the author has had more time to think about and discuss and ruminate with the, the traditions surrounding Jesus' life and message. John is a very different gospel from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often called the synoptics, because they share over 50% of their content. But John is very and completely different. He has a different timeline. He has a, a different way of telling the story. But I find his gospel to be the prettiest and the richest in detail. He has a way of formatting his stories, his narrative, that is both intriguing and frustrating, all wrapped up in one. Using this text specifically, but the way this, this is a representative of, of how John tells his stories, Nicodemus, who I'll just call Nick because Nicodemus is too long, Nick comes with a compliment about how Jesus must be from God because the signs and wonders he does are so impressive that that's the only explanation. And Jesus responds by saying, that saying something confusing about the signs aren't what it's important, it's that a person must be born again, which is then misunderstood by Nick, and, and after, he, after he seeks more clarification about, well, how can someone as old as I am go back into his parents' womb and be born again? Jesus says something even more confusing, differentiating between what is flesh and what is spirit. But Nick presses even further and still doesn't understand. And even in his still ununderstanding, Jesus gets frustrated. He gets frustrated and is almost insulting to Nick. Jesus can't seem to understand how Nick, who is, is one of Israel's teachers, can't understand the things Jesus is talking about. And so he goes on to explain in more detail. Now, on the one hand, I have to, si to side with Nick on this story. The Greek word that, that is translated born again, the, the NRSV says born from above, can mean either one born from the beginning, as in a completely new entity, can be... It can mean born again, as in born for the second time. Or it can mean, as the, the NRSV translated, but I didn't read it that way, as the, 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 can be born as in from above, as in born from God. Nick seems to, to, to take only the second definition that, that people are born a, a second time while Jesus seems to mean all three ways. Jesus seems to mean that, that people must be born again in a completely and radically new being, as if they were born a second time, only this time from God. Jesus seems to say that the only way one can enter the kingdom of God is to be born of both water and spirit. But then on the other hand, there, there's, there's a different kind of misunderstanding. And there, there's two ways of misunderstanding. First, there's the, the misunderstanding of those who, who misunderstand because they don't yet know enough. They haven't yet reached the state of knowledge and experience that, at which they're able to grasp the concept of whatever we're talking about. When we come across people in that, mind, in that state, it's our job to to teach them, to, to explain things to them in ways that they can understand. But then there's another way of misunderstanding. And this way of misunderstanding is those who are unwilling to understand. This, this misunderstanding is the failure to see, which comes from a refusal to see. Some people can deliberately shut their minds to truth which they do not wish to accept. And to a point, Nick was like that. 
The teaching about a new birth from God should not have been a strange concept to Nick. Ezekiel, for example, had spoken repeatedly about the, new, the need for a new heart that must be created in an individual to be one with God. Ultimately, Jesus keeps trying to explain to Nick what, was, what all of this being, being born again, born from above, what all of this means and how the Son of Man must be lifted up so that all who believe will have eternal life. But Nick is the one, like us, who sometimes comes to Jesus by night. He hovers in the shadows of John's story. He's neither the first in the church, nor will he be the last to follow Jesus from afar. No, and no doubt it was difficult, perhaps even dangerous or deadly, for Nicodemus to follow Jesus publicly during the bright light of day. He was, after all, someone who was, who was an important part of the Jewish establishment for whom Jesus seemed to at first only be a nuisance, a thorn in their side, but later a political problem and threat which must be eradicated. Nick had to be cautious and to exercise discretion he was a Pharisee. He was one of those men who, who over the centuries had studied the law so intently, so carefully that it had been decided that, that tying a knot in a rope was considered work and therefore prohibited on the Sabbath, while tying a knot in a woman's girdle was not considered work and therefore permissible to do on the Sabbath. He was one of these men that over the, over the course of decades and centuries poured over what would be comparable to hundreds and thousands of pages of legal opinions on every single verse of Jewish law and came to the decision that you could walk 1,000 yards from your home on the Sabbath without it being work. But the instant you went 1,000 yards and one inch, you've now done work. He's one of those people who is so intelligent, so rational, so focused in his faith, and yet he questions. He's not entirely ready to take the final leap, so to speak. He was the forerunner of many of Jesus' disciples throughout history who have felt the need to be careful about when and how they practice their discipleship. His seven letters to the churches in Asia, John, John of Patmos in, in those letters were, warns them to, be, to beware of the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2. The Nicolaitans were Christians who were, who were willing to offer worship and sacrifice to the pagan and Roman gods in order to remain unnoticed, if not tolerated, in a pagan non-Christian world. The 16th century reformer John Calvin referred to those who sympathized with the movement for reforming the church but were reluctant to publicly identify with that group as the Nicodemites. In the midst of National Socialism, Nicodemus's heirs, the, the, the German Christians of the time, sought to accommodate the gospel to the racism and anti-Semitism of Nazi ideology. These are the same groups of people in our churches in the civil rights movement who believed in equal rights and yet would not stand up and say they're human too, treat them as such. And it goes on and on and on. If any character of the Bible can be regarded as representative of our current postmodern 21st century members in our churches, it might just well be Nicodemus. In many ways, he's a sympathetic character of which I agree and, and, and see myself a lot in him. He was a, a successful and self-confident man. He plays a leadership role in his community. He is a valued member and a valued mind to those who know him. He is spiritually open and curious, yet he's also extremely 
rational. Jesus catches his attention and he, and he doesn't understand. And so he approaches Jesus directly and tries to figure out what his actions and meanings mean. What, what this gathering of sinners and the tax collectors and zealots and the least of these, what does all of that mean? Nick is committed and curious enough that he makes an appointment to talk with Jesus face to face. However, he can't yet go public with that interest. He can't just show up at an engagement Jesus is doing at lunch in the temple and go, you know, I really like what you had to say there, but I don't really understand it all. So instead of making an appointment in the middle of the day when, when it would be public, he sets an appointment with Jesus in the middle of the night so that he can keep his faith secret, separated from the rest of his life, and also so that they would have time that he could ask these questions without being disturbed. His imagination and curiosity is, is intrigued by Jesus, and he, he, but he wants to compartmentalize whatever faith he has at this point. Nicodemus is not yet ready to declare his faith in the light of day. He's not yet prepared to let it change his life. But the two other times he's mentioned in Scripture, he gets closer and closer. About the midway part of, of John's Gospel, I don't remember if it's, I think it's John 19, the, there's a, a meeting of the Pharisees and, and they're, they're debating Jesus and is he a threat or is he good or where do we stand on this? And the, the Gospel of John says that the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night defended Jesus in this meeting. When Jesus is, has, has been crucified, Nicodemus goes with Joseph of Arimathea and they get the body and they put Jesus' body in Joseph's tomb and he buys the hundred pounds of spices and aloes to anoint Jesus' body. He gets there, but at this point in the story, he's not yet ready to go public. But whether we like it or not, whether we look into the eyes of people like, like Nicodemus every Sunday morning in our pews. Being a mainline Protestant church is not exactly trendy and hip. And though people may occasionally come to church or even be active members, many of us, many with whom we interact, are Nicodemuses in their wider life. They have faith, sometimes very deep faith, and they're spiritually curious, and they, they want to understand, but they keep faith in its own sphere. I went to a, a digital ministry conference a week or so, about a week ago now, and, and part of the discussion in the, the larger context of managing the church's online footprint and doing it well was the question of whether or not clergy should have separate personal and professional presences. Should, they, should, should I, as a clergy person, have a personal Facebook and Twitter account and then a professional one where I can put what I did Thursday night on this one and what I talked about Sunday morning over here? But my thoughts, as, as, a, as a clergy person, I can't in good faith expect you to be faithful and honest to who you are, whether it's Thursday night or Sunday morning, if I can't. If I can't talk about my faith as one being paid to do so, how can I expect those of us who don't, who just have that faith, who see people and yet can't talk about it. Being a Nicodemus-like Christian is understandable, though, in our 21st century. Believers who have, who have mixed, family, mixed belief families or pluralistic work settings privilege tolerance and mutual respect over witnessing who's right and who's wrong. 
cultural norms in our day have pushed religion into the private sphere, positioning faith as appropriate for family and, morali and personal morality, but inappropriate for the town square. For two centuries now, mainline Protestantism has encouraged such behavior and attitudes. Our brand of religion promotes self-restraint, tolerance, and personal morality, and all, are which, all of these are worthy values and causes. We support public morality and an engagement in social issues, of course, but that message has been muffled by the declining size and increasing marginalization of mainline Protestant denominations. If people in our pews are Christians like Nicodemus, it's not necessarily because they don't, they, they've somehow failed as believers. In some cases, we have pushed them to compartmentalize their faith. Sometimes they're just not there yet. Sometimes they're questioning and they just don't understand how this passage and this passage mix but in and of itself there there's much to praise about a faith that thrives in the dark there's much to praise about a faith that thrives when no one is looking when no one knows this faith is a genuine is many times a genuine heartfelt personal and deep faith my point is not that, that this hidden faith is a bad thing. My point is that it's too small. As Herb had mentioned a minute ago, I'm completing my third year at Bright this semester and will graduate in December and ordination early next year. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's both thrilling and terrifying all in one feeling. But one thing I've come to understand in these three years is that the greatest sin of liberal Christianity, and what I mean by that term liberal Christianity, I don't, I don't mean Democrat or Republican necessarily, I mean all of us who would not agree with the message or the tactics of Westboro Baptist Church and all these religious organizations who protest holding picket signs that say things like God hates fags, and I should not have said that, and God, but God hates everyone, and instead we know and worship and love a God who gives mercy and grace, who saved a wretch like me while I was yet a sinner because he loved me. No, the greatest sin of liberal Christianity is that we do not give voice to the God of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness which we serve and know. The main Christian voice people hear is about a God who hates everyone, who is vindictive and ruthless and cruel and judgmental. And while, yes, you can find those passages and imagery of that kind of God in our Bibles, I believe John 3.16 overrides all of that. <clears throat> God took the initiative. God took the initiative himself and offered to the entire universe love. God loves you. God loves me. We are the world. But not only are we, we aren't all of the world, yet we are the world, but so is the, the drug addicts and the prostitutes and the murderers and the rapists and the refugees and the rich and the poor and the prisoner and the free. God loves us. God loves all of us. God loves us in our faith and in our unbelief. God loves us in our questioning and in our, in our, in our trying to figure out how is this possible? Where were you? God loves us. God loves you. God loves me. We are the world, and because of God's love for each and every single one of us, God sent his only son so that all we had to do was believe in him, and he would take care of the rest. And for that, all I can say is thanks be to God.
Amen.